All right, it's good to be back with you this evening. And I want to hit some of the science tonight because people have the impression, a lot of people have the impression that evolution is based on science and then creation. Well, that's just a faith system. Well, it, it is, actually both are faith system. It's just a question of whether that faith makes sense, whether it's logical. And I would argue that biblical creation is logical. It's a, it's a faith system that makes sense. It's based on what God has said in his word. God has demonstrated that the Bible is his word in many different ways. And when we examine the evidence, we're gonna find that it confirms biblical creation. Now, I've, I had the opportunity over my career to meet a lot of people, a lot of brilliant PhD scientists. When I was at the University of Colorado, I was surrounded by PhD scientists. Most of them were secular. Most of them did not have a Christian worldview, uh, but they were very brilliant. There's no doubt about that. And then since then, I've had the opportunity to meet many PhD creation scientists. I know a lot of them and uh, brilliant people as well. And so I think it's interesting that, that there are brilliant people who believe in evolution and there are brilliant people who believe in biblical creation. So obviously the issue is not about intelligence. It's not about education because again, you have PhDs believing in evolution, you have PhDs believing in creation. That's not the issue. So why do we come to very different conclusions? We have a different way of looking at the world because you see creationists and evolutionists, we look at the same world. We just look at it with a different worldview, a different way of thinking is like a lens through which you understand the evidence. And of course the, uh, the person who believes in evolution, when he, when he looks at the world, he's thinking in terms of chance processes, millions of years of death and suffering leading up to all the different uh, life forms on earth, allegedly. And so when he, when he comes to the fossil, he's already got a, an idea about how that fits into history. He's thinking in terms of the secular view of history. And I, I don't blame him for having a worldview. We all have a worldview. Uh, you can't get a, around that. But the difference is my worldview is right <laughs> and it's just wrong because mine's based on the revealed word of God in, in so much as my worldview is based on scripture. Obviously, I could be mistaken in areas that are uh, away from that. Uh, when I look at the world, I think in terms of the history that has been recorded by eyewitnesses. You realize that, of course, when we talk about you know, the events of the, the Bible, these were witnessed by people and they wrote them down and we have the documents today. And we know that, we, we know that they're authentic because we have, in terms of the number of manuscripts we have of the Bible, the Old and New Testaments, in terms of the, the smallness of the time between when they were written and when they were found, that's how you measure the authenticity of an ancient document. Do you know what the most authentic ancient document of the ancient world is by that standard? It's the Bible. Nothing else comes close to it. It really is unique, and it's a revelation from God. It's not just any history book. It's a history book that claims to have been inspired by God, and therefore is accurate in everything it touches. And so when you pick up the Bible, you're picking up a history book that tells you the true history of the universe, and, and that's how I look at the evidence, and that's how we should look at the evidence. We shouldn't ignore history in favor of guesswork. We should use history to understand the world around us. Uh, we, we like to think of it as the seven C's of history, seven words that start with a C. It's a nice way to remember uh, biblical history, beginning with creation, where God created the perfect world. There was no disease or suffering or death of any of the nefesh kai, any of the living organisms. But then the world became corrupted because Adam sinned. Adam was given charge over the world, and so when he sinned, his sin affected everything that's under his authority. We understand that. Sometimes we have some leaders that, that sin. They do things that are wicked, and those of us who are under their authority experience some of the consequences of that. That's the nature of authority. There was catastrophe. Uh, God judged the world because he's a righteous judge, and when the evil came to a point that God said, that's it, and he flooded the world, and so that's why we find a lot of the fossils that we find today. But people and animals were saved on board an ark, the Bible says. After the flood, there was confusion. Only about 100 years later, there was the Tower of Babel where people again rebelled against God, and God uh, scattered them by confusing their tongues, confusing their languages, and we think that's the basis for the basic language groups that we have in the world today. Languages diversify on their own a little bit, but the, the root of that was Tower of Babel. And then we have Christ, God himself steps into history, 
to deal with the problem of sin. He does that on the cross. He takes our place on the cross. And then there's one step that's yet in the future, and that's the consummation. God's promised that paradise lost will be paradise restored. That's something we all look forward to. And really, that consummation, it begins when we receive Christ as Savior. We're a, we're a new creation at that point. But it's exciting to see the day when everything will be made new. And we can only be a part of that new creation if we've trusted in Christ. Otherwise, we'd ruin that new world the same way we ruined the original. So when I look at the world, I look at it in light of biblical history. Now, the point this evening is not to demonstrate that my worldview is better than the atheistic worldview. I do have other resources on that. The point this evening is to show you that you can look at the evidence in light of biblical creation and it makes sense. Science confirms biblical creation and it does that in a number of ways. There are three branches of science I'm gonna cover briefly this evening. We'll start with genetics, which is the study of how traits are passed on from one organism to the next. To the next. Uh, information theory, and maybe you haven't heard of that one, but it's, it's, uh, it's really popular right now in terms of how information is uh, transmitted and how it originates. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about geology, things like rock layers, as well as the fossils that are contained within those rock layers, paleontology. So again, I can't give you the, the, the full spread on, any, uh, on all of these things, but I think it's helpful for Christians to know a little bit about each of these topics as a conversation starter. That's the way to go with it, to, to, to get people to think about this evidence and, and, and to realize that evolution maybe is not the best explanation for it. This evidence challenges evolution but confirms biblical creation. So let's start with genetics, the study of heredity, the study of how animals change from one generation to the next. Do animals change? How about dogs, for example? Do dogs change? Do dogs change? What do, what do they change into? Dogs, yeah. Dogs change into dogs. But you can get different breeds of dogs, and we understand how that works because we understand genetics today. That's something that I'll cover. But you'll notice something, they always remain dogs. Dogs have always been dogs. They're dogs now, and they always will be dogs. But you can get different breeds. There's no doubt about that. Uh, so we believe that animals change, but we believe they change within kinds. And that's something the Bible discusses in Genesis 1. It has this phrase that God created organisms after their kind or after his kind. It includes both plants and animals. Uh, each of those re reproduces. It's created after its kind. Appar that the kind apparently is the reproductive limit of an organism because when God flooded the world, he took two of each kind of organism on board Noah's Ark. So that would seem to be the reproductive limit. So organisms are the same kind if they're genuinely related. And so all dogs are related. They're all descended from just two dogs that were on Noah's Ark. You can get all the different breeds later and we'll see how that works as we, as we go along. It's important to understand that kind is not the same thing as species. Okay, they're, they're different. Uh, a, spe a species, that's a man-made classification system. The Bible uses the word kind, baramin in the original language, created kind. Uh, it's, they are different. You can get speciation, where you can get organisms that are different species, but they are related. They're the same kind. And so, for example, a group of mosquitoes gets separated from the parent population and, and lives in a different area for 100 years. There's a process called genetic drift where the DNA uh, adjusts a little bit. And then when they're reintroduced, they can't interbreed with the parent population. So they're classified as a new species, but they're still mosquitoes. And they always will be, unfortunately. So there you go. So, see, I find that evolutionists sometimes misrepresent what it is that creationists teach. And they'll say, oh, you know, creationists believe that God created every species just as we see them today. That is not what creationists teach. It's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach fixity of species, that all animals are exactly the same as they were at creation. They're not. They've, they've changed. Some of, them, some of them have gone extinct. Uh, we understand that. I don't believe that there were poodles in the Garden of Eden because it was a paradise, right? <laughs> Animals have changed a bit. There may have been dogs there, but uh, they've changed a bit. So this is not what creationists believe. It's certainly not what the Bible teaches. What we actually believe in is variation within a kind. And some of the variations are rather extraordinary. You can get different, the, the different cats are all related, by the way. Those, the, the, uh, the big lion that you see at the zoo and that little, that little thing you come home and pet, they're related. There was only two cats on Noah's Ark, and we can demonstrate that through uh, interbreeding studies. We'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later. But yes, we believe that God created the original kinds, dogs, cats, and so on. 
back at creation and they have diversified into different breeds, sometimes different species, but they're still the same kind as they were originally. And so that's just variation within a kind. Some of them have gone extinct. There are some um, animals where, where some varieties have gone extinct, but other varieties of the same kind remain, like elephants. Elephants are, and, and mammoths, we think, are part of the same genesis kind, but the mammoth variety has gone extinct, whereas uh, there are at least uh, two species of elephants that, that are still extant today, two or three. Now, in the evolutionary view, there really aren't kinds, because in the evolutionary view, everything's related. Right? In, in, evolutionists, they believe that they're related to broccoli. That's their distant cousin. And I mentioned that one time. I'm not making fun of them. I mentioned it one, that one time. I was speaking to a group of atheists, and I, I said, you realize that in your view, you, re, you believe that broccoli is your distant cousin. And uh, afterwards, one of them came up to me and said, you know, weren't you kind of poking fun at us for saying that we believe we're related to broccoli? I said, but isn't that what you believe? He says, well, yeah. I said, well, there you go then, right? Don't shoot the messenger. If that sounds a little strange to you, you need to reconsider your belief. Don't, you know, don't get on me for pointing it out. That, that, that's what you believe. I don't believe we're related to broccoli. I do believe we're related to each other. We're all descended from Adam and Eve. But uh, the evolutionary view is that, that uh, single-celled microbes evolved somehow by chance. The right chemicals came together, and then those reproduced. And, and some of them, uh, over the course of time, as they reproduced, their descendants became more and more complex and led to all the different varieties of life that we see today. That's what I mean when I refer, refer to evolution. So there really aren't kinds in the evolutionary view. Everything's related through common descent. That was what Darwin taught. Now, to understand which of these views is consistent with science, we need to know something about DNA. DNA is the molecule of heredity. It is a very long uh, molecular structure that exists in the cells of your body. It looks kind of like a twisted ladder. And on the rungs of this ladder are, are nucleotide base pairs, nucleotide base pairs. And there are four different varieties of nucleotide base pairs, and they're abbreviated by the four letters that you see there, C, G, A, and T. And the C's on one strand always group with the G's on the other, and the, and the A's on one strand always group with the T's on the other. But the order in which that happens, it can be any order. You might have a C followed by a T, and then a G, and then an A, and, and whatever. So that it's a four-letter alphabet, and it spells out the information to make you, which is awesome. You can think of it a bit like beads on a rope. You could spell help in Morse code with beads on a rope. If you, if you knew Morse code, you could do that. And in the same way, DNA has the information to make you. And so there are sections of your DNA that that instruct how to make eyeballs and how to make hair and how to make you know, the various organs of your body. It's, it's amazing. You've got about three billion of these base pairs on a strand of DNA, and you have two uh, complete copies of your DNA. You get one from dad, you get one from mom. They have two copies of DNA. They got it from their parents and so on all the way back to Adam and Eve, and they got their two copies from God. So uh, if, and it's, it, I love the way this works. It's absolutely ingenious because God was able to build in an enormous amount of variation of features that human beings have in terms of different color eyes and different shades of skin and so on. That's a very good thing and it's something that God built into Adam and Eve because it's the combination of those, of those genes, those sections of DNA that determines what traits you'll have. And so a gene is just a section of, a, of DNA that codes for a trait. And so, for example, uh, when, when mom and dad, when they have children, only each, each child only gets half of the DNA instructions from each parent. So they, they end up with a complete set of DNA as well. So, and you don't know in advance which of the genes they're going to get. So they might get that one from dad, that one from mom. And, uh, and that's what builds up the, the child. And so they have a unique combination. And so you might know this, you look a little bit like your dad, a little bit like your mom, that's because you got your genes from them, but you also have features maybe that they don't have because you have a combination of DNA that they don't have. Each one of you has a unique combination of DNA unless you have an identical twin. And so that's why you can have all this different variety in human beings, it's quite amazing. It, it's, it's ingenious, really. Uh, God packing all that information, all the, all the traits that, that we have in this room, the information was in Adam and Eve. That's kind of neat. Uh, here it is with blood type, and maybe you covered this in uh, high school, but uh, genes and blood type, here's how it works. So uh, sometimes you have genes that are dominant and recessive, and a dominant gene will cover up a recessive gene. So if there's a combination, the dominant one wins. And so, for example, if, you're, if you have an A 
a gene from dad and an A gene from mom, your blood type will be A, that's easy. If you have an A gene from dad and an O gene from mom, your blood type's still A because A is dominant, O is recessive. If you have a B from one parent and an O from the other, your blood type's B. If you have A and B, your blood type's AB because they're both, they're co-dominant. And then the only way you can have blood type O is to have two O genes. And so that's, that's blood type in a nutshell. Those are the four types of blood that human beings have. And the interesting thing is if, if mom has blood type A, and it's what we call the heterozygous A, meaning you have an A and an O, and dad has heterozygous type B, the children can have any possible blood type because they could get the A gene, the A allele from mom, and then the B allele from, or the O allele from dad, their blood type would be A. They could get uh, the B from dad, the O from mom, their blood type's B. They could get the A from mom, the B from dad, their blood type's AB. Or they could get uh, O from mom, O from dad, their blood type's O. So I think it's interesting because mom has blood type A, dad has blood type B, one child might have blood type O. And he said, am I adopted? No, you're not adopted. You got the information from your mom and dad. You just have a unique combination of traits. And so that's how it works with eye color and so on. There are at least eight genes involved in eye color. It's the same way it works with skin shade. People make a big deal about, you know, there's these different races of people. No, there's not. There's one race of people, human beings, and it's just different variations that God has put in the information in our, in our DNA. Now, this is simplified a little bit, but basically, uh, skin shade, and, and we talk about skin color. It's really skin shade because we all have the same skin color, brown. It's just a question of how much. How much do you have? Because there's a pigment called melanin. There's a couple different forms of it. There's a gray form and kind of a yellowish form. But uh, if you have a lot of this pigment, you tend to have very dark skin, and if the pigment is well distributed. And so in the, uh, in the upper left box that you see there, people in that category have very dark skin. Those that are in the bottom right box have very light skin. Now, if you're in that bottom right box and you have all lowercase letters, and you get married to somebody that's in that white box, they have lowercase letters, their kids are going to have lowercase letters. Your kids are going to be very light-skinned as well. They're, they're, you can see how that, that's the only possibility. But suppose you're in that upper right box where you have big A, little a, big B, little b, and you get married to somebody in that upper right box, big A, little a, big B, little b. The children could have any possible skin shade in one generation. So we think Adam and Eve probably were a middle brown, and their children could have had any skin shade from very dark to very light. And that was the norm for the world until people started segregating themselves, really. There's still places in the world today where at the same dinner table you can have people that are very light-skinned and dark-skinned, their brother and sister. Uh, certain places in India, for example, where that's very, very common. We're going to talk about dogs because there's a lot of variations that God has built into the dog kind. And I like dogs, too, so there's that. But um, you can get these different variations in, in, in fur length and so on, and it's all built into the information that God built in the original t uh, dogs, the original dogs that he created back in the creation week. So we all have this information, these instructions in our DNA. Now, we, th we have things like microbes, bacteria. They have some instructions in their DNA. A horse has some instructions in its DNA. It actually has a lot more instructions in its DNA. Um, apparently a horse is a more complicated animal than a bacterium. They're both complicated. If you think a bacterium is simple, I'd like to see you build one. I'm just saying. They're, they're not simple. But a horse is more complex. A horse is multicellular and its cells are specialized. They do different things. It has instructions in its DNA that bacteria lack, right? Because a horse has instructions to make eyeballs. Bacteria do not have that information in their DNA and therefore they can't make eyeballs. Uh, a horse has information for hooves and for bones and, de and bacteria don't have that information, okay? Now, if bacteria eventually evolved into horses or microbes, some kind of microbes evolved into horses, which is what evolutionists believe, then obviously at some point they had to gain those instructions, right? You start with a microbe that doesn't have instructions for bones and and, and uh, eyeballs and feet and so on, and you end up with an organism that does have that information, at some point it had to gain information. And so it seems to me that evolution, if it's gonna work at all, there has to be a process to increase the information in your DNA. Does that make sense? Yeah, because you can't even get out of the water if, if, uh, if you're losing information, that's not, gonna, that's not gonna work. And I think it's very interesting because most of the examples, in fact, pretty much all of the examples that people cite of evolution in action are actually reducing the information in your DNA. They're not increasing it. They're in the wrong direction. 
to make evolution happen. It'd be more like a horse becoming bacteria than the other way around. So if you're not increasing information, it's not evolution, not in the Darwinian sense. Uh, one process uh, that exhibits this in, in particular is natural selection. A lot of people think that natural selection is evolution. It's not. It's actually the opposite when you understand it. Natural selection is a true principle. In fact, uh, there was a creationist who wrote about it. People think Darwin came up with natural selection. I think he invented the term, but not the idea. Edward Blythe, who was a creationist who preceded Darwin by at least 20 years, wrote about what we would call natural selection. It's a creationist idea. So, but what is natural selection? Well, let's consider this. Consider, suppose you have two dogs, and uh, suppose they have one gene for short fur and a gene for long fur, and suppose those genes have a combined effect, and so these dogs have medium length fur. Now, this is simplified, but the basic genetic principles here are true. And so those dogs uh, fall in love, and they have, uh, they have offspring. Now, some of the pups will get the short gene from mom, the short gene from dad, and they will have short fur, right? And then some of the dogs will get the short gene from one parent, the long gene from the other, and they'll have medium length fur just like their parents. Statistically, 50% of the population will have that combination. And then one fourth of the offspring statistically will get the long gene from mom, the long gene from dad, and they'll have very long fur. And now already you can see variation within a kind, right? I mean, there's no evolution so far because we started with dogs, we ended up with dogs. That's not evolution, that's just dogs, right? And we haven't, in, we haven't increased any information. We started out with information for short, long, and by combination medium, and we ended up with those varieties expressed. Same information's present in the, in the population. So no evolution so far. Oh, but let's suppose that the environment gets very, very cold. And so what happens is the dogs that have the shorter and the medium length fur, they don't do so well in that cold environment, right? And so sadly, they die. Very sad. Uh, or at least they, they don't survive as well as the dogs that are, that are insulated. Sometimes natural selection doesn't result in death, it just results in fewer uh, members of that particular group. But in any case, the dogs that do very well in a cold environment are the ones that have the long fur, and they find other dogs, and uh, they fall in love, and they have pups. Now this time what's gonna happen is all the pups are gonna have long fur. Because you see, that's the only combination that's left. And so those other varieties have disappeared. Uh, they have traits that are not conducive to survival. That, that is, these other varieties, the short-haired and medium-haired dogs, have traits that are not conducive to survival in a cold environment. And so they have a greater tendency to be wiped out in that environment. The dogs that survive are the ones that are well-suited to it. And so pretty soon, you find all the dogs that live in that cold area, they all have long, they all have long fur. Is this evolution? No, it's the opposite of evolution because we haven't gained any new information. We started with information for long, short, and by combination medium, and we ended up with information just for long. The information's actually been reduced. That's interesting. If the environment got hot, would they go back to having short or medium length fur? No, because they're dead, right? The ones that had the, the short gene, they're gone. And so these, these dogs would just die out, unless there were a few that you know, migrated in from a different area or something. Now, if we started the experiment over, and this time, let's say the environment gets, you have, so we have all three varieties, and this time the environment gets very hot. This time the dogs with the longer fur, they don't do so well in that hot environment, and so sadly they die. But the dogs that have the shorter fur, they do perfectly well in a warm environment. They're able to dissipate heat better, and so they find other dogs that have survived, and they reproduce, and pretty soon all the dogs have short fur, because if they didn't, they're dead. Again, this is not evolution. Now, it is an example of natural selection, it's a great example of adaptation. The environment changed and the dogs as, as, a, as a kind, as a group of organisms, uh, their traits shifted to be favorable to that environment. But it's not evolution because we haven't gained any new information at all. In fact, we've lost information. Natural selection is the opposite of evolution. It's sort of ironic that Darwin thought it could power evolution when in fact it's the opposite. But he didn't know about things like DNA and genes. So this is why we find that dogs, as they spread out in the world, those that end up in the cold climates tend to have the longer fur. Those who end up in the hot climates tend to have the shorter fur. If they didn't, they would die. Now dogs, of course, are a mobile creature, so they might have the intelligence to kind of go to an environment that is suitable to them. But uh, plants, for example, you can find the same with plants, and they can't move. They're kind of stuck wherever they, wherever they land. And if they're not suitable to that environment, the plant dies. So organisms are well-suited to their environment. 
God has placed in them the potential for lots of different varieties. And so you see, you don't need two of each different breed of dogs on board Noah's Ark. You just need two dogs. That's all you need. And they get off of Noah's Ark and they spread out and they, and they, they carry different traits with them and they spread out to different parts of the world carrying certain combinations. And if the combinations lead to traits that are suitable to survival in that environment, they survive and reproduce. If they don't have traits suitable to that environment, they tend to perish. And so this is why we find that in wild dogs, uh, you find they're well-suited to their environment. God gave that ability to the dog kind to diversify. And so there you go. That's, that's the different varieties of wild dogs that we find in the world. They're all well-suited to their environment. And there are certain traits that can get locked in, too, that don't really have any survival value one way or the other, like the eye color. That doesn't have a huge impact on survival. But, you know, a group that goes this way, just ha they all happen to have genes for blue eyes or whatever. Uh, so that can get locked in, too. That's um, genetic drift is what that's called. But evolutionists say, oh, but Dr. Lyle, it's not just natural selection. It's natural selection and mutations. So let's talk about mutations. A mutation is a mistake in your DNA. Your DNA actually has the ability, well, the cells in your body have the ability to replicate that DNA, and that's necessary for, uh, for, for our body to replenish itself and so on, but also when you have children to pass that information on. A mutation could be the result of a copying mistake. The process by which the genes in your DNA are copied to the new strand is brilliant. It's ingenious, but it's not 100% accurate. Uh, but, but God knowing that, there's actually a mechanism that will correct most mutations. Interestingly, you actually have a, a spell checker in your DNA, which it, it's amazing. And, uh, but in any case, every now and then, because of sin and the curse, we no longer live in a perfect world. And so every now and then, a mistake occurs in your DNA, and some instructions are lost or they're scrambled. And so, for example, dogs, all dogs should have information for four normal, healthy legs. They have certain instructions that make those legs. But due to mutations, there's some copying mistakes, and they end up with, occasionally end up with a dog with short, stubby little legs. And because he's missing some instructions, that's what a mutation does. And if you think about it, a dog like that on the, uh, on the right over there, he's not going to do very well in the wild, is he? Because he, with those short, stubby little legs, he can't run very fast. He can't catch anything, nor can he escape something that's trying to catch him. So uh, he's not going to have a lot of luck in the, uh, in the wild. And so if you think about it, natural selection, to some extent, will tend to weed out mutations a little bit. Some mutations are immediately fatal. You get it and your heart doesn't form properly and you're dead. And that, that, tr that mutation is not passed on, right? It can't be because the, the, the organism dies. But, uh, it, but the thing with dogs is some people like dogs that have short, stubby little legs because they can't jump up on you as much. And so people will take these dogs and they will care for them and give them food and water. And these dogs don't have to survive in the wild because they have a human caretaker that can, that can deal with their, their problems. And so they take these dogs and interbreed them with other dogs and you end up with lots of dogs with short, stubby little legs. That's how that happens. And that's why domestic breeds of dogs tend to be full of mutations. They really are. Uh, and that's why you gotta spend millions of dollars on them trying to keep them alive because they're, they're missing some instructions. <laughs> Uh, that make it hard for them to survive otherwise. They couldn't survive in the wild. A lot of them couldn't. There's a mutation that causes a dog's snout not to form properly. A dog's supposed to have a long snout, and that helps with their ability to, to smell and so on. But there's a mutation that causes the snout to be short, but the jaw was designed to fit the longer snout, so they have a horrible underbite. And the skin was designed to fit the longer snout. It hangs off the side. Some people think that's cute. You think the dog says, gee, I love having my nose stuffed into my face. That's great. <laughs> You may not enjoy it so much. Poodles have some uh, problems. And uh, I'm not anti-poodle, they're very cute, but they do have some problems because they have mutations that have accumulated in their DNA. And so these are some diseases they can get either as a direct result of a mutation or as a secondary effect. One of the mutations in poodles that I find interesting is that their hair grows forever. A dog's hair is supposed to grow so long and then it falls out and that regulates the hair growth. With, the, with a poodle, that gene has been damaged. And so their hair grows indefinitely, which is why every now and then you gotta give your poodle a haircut. You got to. Now, uh, that can cause, if you don't, it can cause problems because it can get in their eyes, the hair can get in their eyes and they can cause an infection, they can go blind, it can get in their ears. It can cause problems there, they can get infections. Some of these infections can kill them. And if you think about it, a dog like that, there's no way a poodle could survive in the wild. 
because it needs a haircut every now and then. I mean, after a while, it'd just be a big poof ball, and there's no way it could survive. <laughs> so uh, that's why it needs a human caretaker to, to give it a haircut every now and then and to protect it from some of these uh, problems that are due to a loss of information. And so you see, this is an evolution. It's not like we're, we're generating a new kind of organism here. We've just removed some instructions, and as a result, this, this little animal has some problems. So that's how we account for the different breeds of domestic dogs. It's simply the genetic instructions that God put in their DNA and mutations, mistakes that have come in, removed little bits of that information, and so domestic breeds tend to have some problems. But it's not evolution because it's in the opposite direction. Evolution's about increasing information. The, the different breeds of dogs, domestic dogs, is a result of loss of information. We think the dogs that came off Noah's Ark were like the, very much like the wolf kind. Wolves still have a great deal of what we call heterozygosity, big A, little a, big B, little b. But by selectively breeding them, and through uh, mutations where you lose information, and then you, but it's, it generates a trait that people like. The dog might not like it, but the people like it. And you interbreed those, you get all the way down to the poodle, but it's not, an, it's not a new and improved animal. It's kind of the bottom of the line, actually, really. I mean, you start with the more wild kinds of dogs. When, I, when I'm explaining this to kids, I say, you know, it's the DNA, the information in your DNA is like jelly beans. You start out with the wild kinds of dogs, lots of information, lots of possibilities. And then through, you know, then you breed them and you get down and down until you get the poodle. And then he's, he's got kind of the, the minimum amount of information it needs to, to be a dog. So... <laughs> A friend of mine who actually has a, a poodle or a similar dog, he says that, that uh, poodles are kind of like, if, if you think of cars, you know, you can think of the wolf as being kind of like the Rolls Royce and it's got all these extra features on it, windshield wipers for the headlights. I mean, you don't really need that, but it's just a kind of a bonus feature. Whereas a poodle is more like a Kia. It's kind of the, the bottom of the line. You remove one part from a Kia, it doesn't work anymore. It's because it's got the bare minimum information there. Now, could you turn a dog into a cat by removing jelly beans? No. A cat has different information in its DNA. They say, oh, but some of the instructions are the same. That's true, because we use some, we, you know, we use some of the same proteins. Uh, that's really important, because it means we can eat similar foods and gain nutrients from them. So yes, there are similarities, but there are a lot of differences. And you can't get those changes, the, those different set of instructions, by simply removing instructions. And that's all natural selection and mutations do, is remove instructions. So when we take a look at dogs and see how they reproduce, this is good observational science. It's something we can test in the present. We find it's consistent with God having created the original kinds and they've diversified since. It's not consistent with the evolutionary notion that organisms gain information over time. We do not observe that. I should point out that mutations can be beneficial in certain circumstances, but it's still by losing information. There are some cases where you can lose some instructions and under certain conditions it can actually help you survive. I'll give one example here, antibiotic resistance. Because evolutionists say, oh, this is evolution in action. And, you know, bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics. But if you understand why, you'd realize it's not evolution at all. First of all, they haven't changed. They're still bacteria. They haven't changed into a new organism. And they've lost some instructions. It's just that in that situation, it actually helps them. There's a bacterium called H. pylori that causes stomach ulcers. And you go to your doctor, and he gives you an antibiotic. Now, an antibiotic, which is harmless to you, uh, goes into the... Uh, the H. pylori, and he's got an enzyme in him that breaks down, it, when it interacts with an antibiotic, it turns it into a poison, and the poison kills the bacterium, and you feel better until you get your medical bill. There is a mutated form of H. pylori that is missing the instructions to produce that chemical. And so when the antibiotic goes into him, it just sits there, because he lacks the ability to convert it into the poison that would kill him. And so they actually survive, but they survive because they're missing some instructions they can't produce that, that reactant, or at least not very much of it. They can produce a little bit, but not very much. And so, that's, by the way, that's why you need to take all of your antibiotic even after you're feeling better, because you've killed the normal variety, but there's a few of these mutants going around, and uh, you need to continue to take the antibiotic, because eventually it'll kill them too. They do have a little bit of that uh, chemical. But if you don't do that, then if you just, when you, you know, start to feel better, you, st you go off your antibiotic, then the mutant form, they reproduce. And now you get a form that's harder to kill by antibiotics. But you see, it's not that they've gained superpowers or anything like that. It's just that they, they're resistant to antibiotics because they've lost some information. They've lost the ability to produce an enzyme that is part of their normal system. And they don't compete well with bacteria outside of an environment that's full of antibiotics. 
Uh, Dr. Lee Spetner's PhD is in biophysics, says all point mutations that have been studied on a molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information, not to increase it. He says not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. There are different types of mutations. There's a mutation that can cause a section of DNA to get duplicated, so you have more DNA. But do you have more information? No. It'd be like, a, you know, in a newspaper, if a paragraph accidentally got duplicated, could you learn anything new from the second paragraph you couldn't learn from the original? There's no new information in there, just longer. So uh, mutations in natural selection are not evolution. They're in, the, they're in the opposite direction. This is good observational science. It's consistent with what we see today, and it's consistent with biblical creation, with God putting that original information in the original organisms, and they've lost some sense. We haven't gained any new information. We've been talking about information. There's a whole branch of science that deals with information theory. And uh, first of all, I think we should define what information is. There's different definitions, but the one that we would like to use for information theory to, to make it uh, good science, it would be defined by at least three criteria. First of all, information always entails a symbolic code system. And so if I pick up a book and I see the word lion, I'm not actually seeing a lion. I'm seeing a word, and that word represents a, you know, a, a, a living animal. But I understand that. There's a code system there. It's, it's not actually a picture of the lion. It's a symbol. It's symbolic. There's language. The books that I read are English, but there are other languages, of course, which means there's a grammar, there's syntax. The words are in a particular order. These, these, these symbolic codes are in a particular order that makes sense. It conveys an idea. And then finally, there's meaning. I could learn something by reading this. There's an expected action uh, and, and an intended purpose. When, when, you read, when we read information, there's a reason why it was written, and there, it's expected that we'll act on that. If, if it's a cookbook, for example, the, um, the purpose is so we could have something to eat, and the expected action is that I'll combine the ingredients in the way the cookbook says. So a cookbook qualifies as information. How about this, could this be information? Does it fulfill our three criteria? Is it a symbolic code system? It looks like it is. Uh, is, there, is there a language convention? Is there a syntax and grammar? Well, the way it's organized in lines should, should, should suggest to you that it probably is. But is there meaning? Well, that's the tricky one. And the only way to know that is to decode it. But fortunately, I know the code. And this is, in fact, information because it conveys meaningful information. It's actually Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning, that's the clipboard there, in the beginning, like the beginning of a movie. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light was good. Isn't that neat? It's a Genesis in the form of icons. Kind of neat. So there is information there. Now, whenever you find information, there are certain laws of nature that apply to it. Just like when you have energy, there's the law of conservation of energy, which says you can't create or destroy energy. So information has its set of laws that go with it too. And one of the laws of nature is that, one of the laws of information theory is that information does not come about by a random process. There is no known law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter, according to Dr. Werner Gitt, one of the world's experts on information theory. And he's got a book called In the Beginning Was Information. It's a very good book, I recommend it. He says, when its progress along the chain of transmission events is traced backwards, every piece of information leads to a mental source, the mind of the sender. According to Dr. Gett, it is a law of nature that whenever you find information, and you, and you, it may have been copied by a process that's non-intelligent. A Xerox machine can copy information, so can a computer. But the origin of that information is always a mind, always. And you sort of know that if you pick up a book, and it's got useful information in it, you probably wouldn't conclude that, well, this came from an explosion in a typewriter, right? <laughs> That'd be silly. You know that somebody wrote the book. Maybe not that particular copy. I mean, you know, somebody didn't handwrite that particular book. It was made by a machine that makes lots of it, lots of those books simultaneously. But where did it get some information? Probably from a computer. Where did it get its information? Another computer. There's been a chain of transmission events. But when you trace it backwards, it'll go back to a mind. Somebody wrote it. That's obvious, isn't it? And yet, what do we find in DNA? Information. Oh. Where did you get the information in your DNA? It was copied from your parents. They got it from their parents. 
It's a chemical process that, that copies it. It's, it the, the chemicals themselves are not intelligent. They're like a Xerox machine. They're just copying that information back and back and back from their parents, from their parents, all the way back to Adam and Eve who got it from the mind of God. Oh, information theory is consistent with biblical creation, but it's not consistent with evolution. Because in the evolutionary view, that information is supposed to have gradually accumulated over time. But we've never seen that. We've never seen information just spontaneously form in matter. It appears that that would be a violation of the law of nature. And you know what? In their heart of hearts, people know that. People know that information doesn't come about by chance. They know it comes from a mind. And I know that because I did a little social experiment years ago. Uh, there, I, I posted this article on the website called On the Origin of Articles, uh, which is a play on Darwin's, you know, On the Origin of Species. And if you read this article, it tries to convince you that articles do not have authors, but they're a result of a collection of typos that have accumulated over <laughs> millions of years. Articles probably started out as a single letter, and then gradually, you know, they became words and sentences, and, and granted, you know, it, it, this is all caused by copying mistakes, and granted, most of those copying mistakes would make the article worse, but those ones get thrown out, you see. It's the ones that make the article better that get passed on, and so eventually articles become longer and better, and that's how all articles originate. It was a fun thing to do, but what was even more fun was when I started getting responses to this. Because <laughs> the evolutionists chimed in, they say, well, we know you wrote this, Dr. Lyle. And I said, how, did, did you see me write it? No, oh, you're taking on faith? Oh, that's interesting, hmm. <laughs> Oh, but, but we could check the IP address and you see you posted it. I admit to posting it. When this thing evolved on my computer, I couldn't help but share it, right? See, but, 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 and they started making excuses. And it was fun for me to play the evolutionist and say, oh, you know, what's, what's wrong with you? Are you one of those authorists that believes in authors? I mean, if you want to believe that, fine, but keep it in church, man. And uh, it, was, it was fun. Now, any one of them could have refuted me. All they would have to say is we know that you or somebody wrote that article because it has information in it. Not one of them made that argument. You know why? They'd have to give up evolution. There's programs like SETI that listen for signals from space, intelligent signals from space, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. They haven't found any. I don't think they will. But there are lots of radio signals in space. The sun gives off radio. It sounds like static. I've listened to it. It's not enjoyable, but you know. There are pulsars that give off radio signals and it's like a pip, 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 just a repeated string. With all these natural radio signals, how can these astronomers distinguish a signal that comes from an intelligent alien species from all these natural signals? And the, the answer is an, a, a signal from an alien intelligence would have information in it. Isn't that interesting? The whole program is predicated on that and yet those same scientists when they look through the Microscope, you know, they look at DNA, all that, there's no intelligence there. That just happened. Inconsistent. What about geology? So let's talk a little about, about rocks and the fossils within them. And the first thing we have to deal with is this little myth that, that rocks are hundreds of millions of years old. And we've been taught that. We've been taught that radiometric dating proves that. So I want to talk a little bit about that process, radiometric dating, how it works. Uh, there are certain atoms, we're all made of atoms, protons, neutrons, electrons circling around there. And most atoms are what we call stable, meaning they'll remain the same kind of atom forever. But there are a small number of atoms that are radioactive or unstable. And what that means is they will, spon they will spontaneously change into another type of atom. You don't have to do anything, they do it on their own. For example, uranium-238 is unstable, it's radioactive. It, it, it'll sit there for a while being perfectly happy, uranium-238, and then poof, it'll, it, it'll eject a uh, helium nucleus and turn into thorium. It, it just happens for certain atoms, particularly some of the heavier uh, elements. And thorium is also radioactive or unstable. And so it's, it'll sit there for a little while and then poof, it'll, one, of the, uh, um, one of the neutrons will eject an electron and become a proton and so it changes into this, this next atom which changes in the next, all the way down to lead 206. Now lead 206 is stable. So once it, it, once it hits there, it'll, lead 206 will stay lead 206 forever. It's not radioactive. And this process takes time. Now for any given atom, we don't know when it's gonna pop and change into the next one. 
but you have a large sample of them, statistically, you know that after a certain period of time, a certain fraction of them will have changed. It's kind of like a popcorn. When you're popping the popcorn, you don't know which kernel's gonna pop next, right? It could be that one, and then, oh, then that one, and then that one, and, but you do know that after about two minutes, you're done. If they're gonna pop, they've popped. It's the same way with this. We, we, we don't know when any individual atom is gonna change, but we do know that statistically, uh, after a certain amount of time, so many of them will have changed. And for uranium to go down to lead, statistically, it takes a very long time for a significant fraction of that uranium to change to lead, because we know over the course of measuring it that just a little bit changes in a year. And so for, for like half of it to change all the way to lead, it would take theoretically billions of years. And so the idea is you can use this like a clock because we find rocks that have uranium in them, including uranium-238. And so the idea, but they also have lead in them. And so the idea is, is if you had a chunk of solid uranium and you waited for a while, eventually it would be part uranium, part lead, part intermediate elements too, and then eventually it'd be all lead. That just naturally happens. And it, it theoretically would take billions of years for uranium to completely become lead. And so the idea is you find a rock that's got some uranium, some lead in it, and you use that knowing the rate at which the uranium changes, and you figure out when it was all, uh, when it was all uranium, if it was all uranium. How do you know it didn't start with some lead? That's the thing we need to remember. You see, you can think of the lead, or the uranium turning into lead, like sand going through an hourglass. Uranium's the top chamber, the lead's the bottom chamber. It, it, one naturally flows into the other, okay? And if, and if you came in here and I had an hourglass and it was halfway through, I said, how long ago do you think I turned that over? He said, well, that's easy, Dr. Lau. It's an hourglass, about halfway through. I'd say about a half an hour. I said, I gotcha. I turned it over only one minute ago, but already a lot of the sand was in the bottom chamber. You see, you can't assume that all the sand is in the top chamber to begin with. And by the same token, you can't assume the rock was 100% uranium to begin with. It might have had some lead in it to begin with. And by the way, secularists do not assume that the rock was pure uranium when it started. They assume it had some lead in it. How much lead did it start with? You tell me how old you want the rock to be, I'll tell you how much lead it started with. You see, there's an issue there. And they're aware of that, and they've, they've got ways to try and deal with that. I'm not trying to sell them short. But there are assumptions that are made when you assume that just because half the sand's in the bottom chamber, it's a half an hour. Uh, how do you know somebody wasn't adding sand when you weren't looking? Uh, uranium is leachable in salt water. It can move in and out of a rock. It's not a, it's not a closed system. How do you know the throat of the bottle's always been the same size? That's probably a pretty good assumption for an hourglass. We can't imagine how that could be too much different. But we don't know that the rate at which uranium changes into lead has always been what it is today. It might have been different in the past. In fact, there's good evidence that it was. And so my point is that all these, these radiometric dating methods, they all rely on assumptions, assumptions about the initial conditions, how much uranium and lead there was to begin with. They assume that the decay rate is constant. We now have very compelling evidence that it's not and that the system is closed. And in most cases, it isn't. And so that's why you get all, all kinds of uh, rather crazy results when you do these things. And, and by the way, we've dated rocks from Mount St. Helens, and radiometric dating is supposed to tell you when the rock hardened. That, that sets the zero point on the clock, okay? And so these are brand new rocks. Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. There were some follow-up eruptions. We took rocks that were brand new from that eruption and sent them in and had them radiometrically dated, which would normally be a ridiculous thing to do because it's expensive, and we know when these rocks form because we saw them form. But we wanted to know if the method was reliable. And you know, they came back with estimated ages of hundreds of thousands to millions of years on rocks that are brand new. You say, that's an isolated incident. It's not. If you go to Hawaii and take a rock from Hawaii, send it in and have it dated, you'll get millions of years very consistently. Uh, so ra radiometric dating has been demonstrated to not work on rocks of known age. And yet secularists assume it works on rocks of unknown age. Now, I don't think that's very scientific. What about carbon dating? Similar process, but with carbon dating, the, the, the time scale is much shorter. Uh, most carbon is C12, because it's got six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus. There's a variety of carbon called C14. It's produced in the upper atmosphere as cosmic rays bombard nitrogen atoms, convert them into C14. And then C14 will gradually decay back into nitrogen. 
it has a half-life of 5,700 years. So if you have a chunk of solid C14, you wait 5,700 years, half of it will have decayed into nitrogen. Now, uh, you all have a little bit of C14 in you because you see, we breathe that air. The plants take in the, carb the carbon dioxide in the air and a small fraction of that, one atom in a trillion, is C14. And then the animals eat the plants or we eat the plants, or we eat the animals that ate the plants. Either way, you're getting that C14 in you. So all of you have a little C14 in you. You're all just a little bit unstable. How about that? <laughs> now, when an, when an organism uh, is alive, that C14 is decaying back into nitrogen, but you're eating new food and you're replacing it. So the C14 to C12 ratio in you is about the same as is in the external environment until you die. But when you die, you're not eating, you're not breathing, you're not taking in any new C14, and so the C14 simply decays away. And so, at, you know, while you're living, the C14 remains constant until you die, and then it decays, decays down. And so the idea with carbon dating is you can use it to tell how long ago something died. And it's, it's neat, it's a clever idea. And the interesting thing is it tends to give answers that are pretty consistent with the biblical time scale. Now, it's based on assumptions too, but when, with carbon dating, when we test it on things of known age, it tends to give sensible answers. It tends to give, it tends to give the right answer. Not always, not 100% of the time, but often. And the interesting thing is we've even tested it on things like diamonds. Diamonds, in the evolutionist's view, are supposed to be one to two billion years old. But you know what? We found C14 in them. C14, the half-life's 5,700 years. In fact, if the entire Earth were nothing but C14, after one million years, you'd not have one atom of it left. It decays too quickly. And yet we find it in diamonds that are supposed to be billions of years old. They can't be anywhere close to that. This demonstrates that these diamonds are, are much, much younger. They're thousands of years old. It's consistent with the biblical time scale. Because the Bible's clear that God created in six days, and that was a few thousand years ago. It's not, the Earth's not billions of years old, as we've been taught, as we've been led to believe. And there are hundreds of physical processes that limit the age of the Earth to much less than the secular time scale. And we see the secularists need the billions of years to make evolution sound plausible. Not that it really would be anyway, but they need that. And, uh, but you look at the evidence and it's consistent with a much younger time scale. One, one example, the rate at which salt flows into the ocean. Even fresh water has a little bit of salt in it. It picks it up from the continents, dumps it into the ocean. The water evaporates, but it leaves the salt. And so the oceans are getting saltier and saltier every year by a little bit. You have 450 million tons of salt that's pumped into the ocean every year and doesn't leave. So the salinity of the oceans has gone up since creation. You can get rid of a little bit of the salt with salt sprays and stuff like that, but only 27% maximum. And if you, if you do the math and you figure out how long ago could the oceans have existed, maximum age of 62 million years. And it sounds like a lot, but that's assuming the oceans started as fresh water, which we don't think they did. If they started as salt water, they'd be much, much younger than 62 million years. But in the secular view, oceans are supposed to be 3 billion years old. So you see, it's a problem because the evidence indicates they can't be more than 62 million years old. And so that's consistent with the biblical time scale because 6,000 is less than 62 million, but 3 billion isn't. The rate at which mud accumulates on the ocean floor. You have about 20 billion tons of mud accumulating on the ocean floor every year. It builds up. You can get rid of a little bit with plate subduction tectonics, but the rest of it just builds up. How long does it take to get the current amount of mud on the ocean floor? Less than 12 million years. And that's assuming there was no worldwide flood, which would dump a lot of mud on the ocean floor very quickly, obviously. So again, that limits the age to much less than 12 million years. Now creation's consistent with that. Creation, about 6,000 years for the age of the earth. Secular view, about 3 billion years. Not consistent with, the data is not consistent with the secular worldview. Human population. I just recently re redid this calculation just to, to check it, but human population, there's no way human beings go back, you know, 100,000 years as the secularists like to think. Uh, we have records, at least estimates of world population over time, we can, we can do the math on that. Human beings go back to the, it, it's the, it fits in with the biblical time scale of about 6,000 years. It's wildly inconsistent with the secular time scale where you try to push it back to 30,000 or 100,000 or even a million years, it's, it's unrealistic. But the best evidence, for the age of the earth is that we have the record, we have the birth certificate of the universe. God tells us he made in six days. It's clear from context, those are ordinary earth rotations, each one bound by an evening and a morning. It's the basis for our work week according to Exodus 2011. That's the best evidence. 
See, the secularists like to come along and say, the earth's billions of years old, take my word for it. But God says, I created in six days, take my word for it. And he was the only one who was there. So, if you think about it. What about these fossils that we find? And we do find fossils all over the world. Here's a fossil ichthyosaur. This is a marine reptile uh, thought to be extinct today. At least we haven't found any living. I always had the impression that fossils took millions of years to form. Uh, well, this, this organism, whatever happened to him happened quickly. Or actually, it's a her because she's giving birth. You see the baby ichthyosaur being born there? They're born tail first because they're air breathers. God thought about that. You know, they're not born like other creatures where they, the head comes out first, the tail comes out first, because as soon as they're born, they have to swim to the surface and get their first breath of air. That's a neat design feature. I wonder how long evolution took to figure that out, needed to turn it around. No, that's not gonna work, not gonna work. There's a, in the lower section there, there's a fish that's buried in the process of eating another fish. Now, I don't think that took millions of years. Whatever happened to them happened quickly. I mean, the thing was, the ichthyosaur was buried, killed, buried in the process of giving birth. It's fossilized now. See, people think that you know, things die and then they slowly become a fossil over millions of years. Most things don't become a fossil at all. And uh, l l let's do a little thought experiment here. And I've been picking on dogs, we'll pick on cats now. So let's do a, an experiment on our dead cat, Earl. We're gonna watch him slowly fossilize over millions of years, right? So don't touch, leave, leave it alone here. We wanna wait a little while. Well, what you end up with day three is a very smelly dead cat on the grass. And on day nine, you end up with a very smelly dead cat on the grass. And on day 20, parts of Earl are missing. And on day 38, more of Earl is missing. And on day 65, Earl's missing. And, and you, you know that because we've seen animals that have been killed and left on the side of the road. They don't just gr gradually turn into statues. That's not what happens. They, they're gone after a while. They get picked off by other animals, scavengers. They, they're, they decay, they're recycled back into the environment. You see, in order to get a fossil, you have to bury something. And even then, I was given the wrong idea that you know, the fish dies, it sinks down to the bottom, and then over, you know, and it's slowly, over millions of years, covered with sediment, one layer after the next. Now, now wait a minute. If it took millions of years for the sediment to be deposited, then why didn't the fish decay? Right? You have to bury something rapidly to get it to fossilize. I mean, if it's just partly buried for millions of years, the top part would decay, it'd be picked off by scavengers. Most fish float when they die anyway. So it, that's not gonna work. That's not how you form a fossil fish. If you really wanna form a fossil fish, here's how you do it. You go home to your aquarium and you dump some concrete in there. This is still legal in Colorado. I'm not sure about here. That's going to bury him. It's going to kill him. It's going to bury him immediately. Uh, usually there's enough bacteria left that they have, they, they have the ability to eat away at the soft tissue of the fish because it's dead now. But the bones permineralize. The minerals move in and fill in the holes in the bone. That's what a fossil is. It's a stone that looks like a bone because it's, it's been permineralized. And that's how you form a fossil. It doesn't take millions of years. We can do it in a laboratory in you know, days. It doesn't take long. It just takes the right conditions. It takes flood conditions to do that. What about the kinds of fossils that we find? Do they illustrate evolution? Because you'll see pictures in textbooks, you know, the evolution of the horse. And, you know, of course we have no idea what the, I mean, they have the stripes on and everything. We don't know what the skin looked like, but we do know what the bones looked like. And it looks, that looks pretty convincing. You got that little horse evolving into a big one, but, but wait a minute, uh, these are horses of different sizes, aren't they? And, well, the foot structure's a little different for a couple of them, okay. But that's, that's a variation within a kind. What you have here are different varieties of horse. You say, well, they're different sizes. That's okay, we have horses today that are different sizes. These are both adult horses. They're just different breeds, you see. And so that's not a problem. It, we have lots of different varieties of horse today. We should expect to find some in the fossil record that have gone extinct, because their, their variety didn't, wasn't you know, conducive to survival in their environment. And yes, some in the past had different, the, the, they didn't have the single, uh, toe. They, it was divided into three or whatever. That's fine. They're still horses. What you don't find is a non-horse changing into a horse. And that's very consistent throughout the fossil record. There will always be a handful of disputed specimens. We'll say, hey, think, we think we found the transition between this and that. But generally, the transitions are from one, from one variety within a kind to another variety in the same kind. Something that's perfectly consistent with biblical creation. But don't rocks take millions of years to form? Here's a set of car keys embedded inside solid rock. 
I don't think that took millions of years to form. Here's a man-made clock embedded inside solid rock. Did that take millions of years to form? I don't think so. What about these rock layers? I mean, look, there's a person down there at the bottom for scale. Surely those took millions of years to be deposited, right? No, those did not exist before 1980, those sediment layers. Not all of them are rocks, some of them are loose, but, but some of them are solid rock. And those were produced in the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. They didn't exist before then. And uh, another eruption came through and sloshed a wave in Spirit Lake and cut through those layers and formed a canyon 1 40th the scale of a Grand Canyon in days, maybe hours. It doesn't take millions of years. See, they used to teach these, these fine uh, laminations that you find in the Grand Canyon, that those are annual. You know, one was laid down and then the next year another was laid down and you add them up, it's millions of layers and therefore millions of years. Except this isn't from the Grand Canyon. This is from uh, the Mount St. Helens eruption. Those layers were all laid down in, simultaneously in a matter of hours. Okay, so it doesn't take millions of years. And those are the same kind of laminations you find in the Tapete sandstone, which covers the, you know, is found in the Grand Canyon and much of the United States and Canada. It's given different names in different parts of the world, but that's continuous. So whatever deposited those layers was covering the continent. A worldwide flood would do that. You know, we find trees in, in, uh, in rocks that are buried vertically, and a lot of them are missing roots. They tend to have a little bit of coal down at the bottom sometimes. I was taught that coal forms over millions of years as peat accumulates in swamps, except we sometimes find impressions of leaves in the coal, so we know what kind of plants were around there, and they're not the plants that are found in swamps. They're the plants that are found in mountain rainforests. So we've been lied to about coal formation. Uh, it can happen very quickly. And these trees often don't have roots, which is strange because most trees I know have roots, right? But we now know how that happens because when Mount St. Helens eruption, erupted, it did it. it. The eruption uprooted trees, that's why they don't have roots, and they tended to float in Spirit Lake. They tended to float vertically because of the little remnant of the root that's left uh, in most cases. And then eventually they get waterlogged and sink down and then sediment would come and cover them up. It, it doesn't take millions of years. This happened recently. We know how it happens now. So you see, when we take a look at the rock layers and we do good observational science, observing things like Mount St. Helens, we say, oh, that's consistent with a recent creation and a global flood. It's not consistent with millions of years of slow gradual processes. You see, the, the, the rocks are not a record of millions of years. The rocks are a record of the worldwide flood, most of them. Now, there are some that happened afterwards, but for the most part, the fossils that we find in them, these, all these dead animals, that's a reminder that God judges sin. And so you see the real message of the rock layers is repent. That's the real message. It's a reminder that God judges sin. God is gracious. He'd love to save everybody, but he's not going to uh, save you unless you repent. He's not going to do that because he's, he's righteous. He's just, and that penalty has to be paid. Uh, again, it comes back to this. The, for the gospel to make sense, creation has to be true. It has to be real history. I'm not saying, nobody's claiming you have to believe in six days to be saved. That's not the point. We're saved by God's grace received through faith in Christ. God doesn't require us to have perfect theology. That's not what I'm saying. But out of gratitude for salvation, we ought to get our theology as right as possible. And we ought to believe everything the Bible teaches, including the history in Genesis, because it's what makes sense of salvation. It's in, it's in Genesis we learn about the worldwide flood, that God judges sin, but also about God's mercy. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he and his family were spared because they trusted God. And uh, I think it's interesting too, God was the one that closed the door on the ark, the Bible says. God was the one that decided time of mercy over, time of judgment begins. And that's the same uh, thing that we experience today. So today's the day of salvation, as I like to say. Uh, we have a number of resources on this. Again, check out our DVD, The Ultimate Proof of Creation. Uh, I haven't attempted to prove creation this evening. I've just shown you how the science is consistent with it. But if you do want to demonstrate that creation has to be true, this DVD will show you how to do that. Uh, we have Understanding Genesis, showing how Christian doctrines go back to the beginning. We have a DVD on Astronomy Reveals Creation, how the universe declares God's glory. And I show evidence in, the, in outer space that the universe is nowhere near billions of years old, because there are processes that happen in space that can't last nearly that long. Very powerful stuff. I have a book that goes along with that called Taking Back Astronomy. Discerning Truth, How to Spot Errors in Reasoning that Evolutionists Make When They Defend Evolution. 
Uh, Worlds of Creation, this is a fun one. This is a DVD that takes you on a tour of the solar system and shows you how each of the planets and many of the moons, how they, uh, how they are consistent with biblical creation and defy a secular evolutionary origin. It's, it's great stuff, and it's very graphical too, which is kind of neat. I used some neat uh, software to do that. Uh, Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky. This is just a fun book on how to better enjoy the night sky from a Christian perspective. And it has star charts. If you want to know when the next meteor shower is, it'll have all that kind of information. You say, I don't have a telescope. That's okay. There's a lot of stuff you can see naked eye or with, with binoculars even. There's star clusters you can see with binoculars if you know where to look. If you do want to get a telescope, we'll tell you how to, you know, what kind you might want to get and how to use it and so on. So that's a, that's a fun resource. Uh, his star. What about the star that guided the wise men, that guided the Magi to Christ? What was that all about? Well, I cover the, the details there on that uh, DVD. Creation evangelism is what I talked about this morning, how to use creation to better uh, witness to people, basically. Dinosaurs in the Bible. The Bible does have some things to say about dinosaurs, yeah, which I think is very interesting. And uh, that's, a, that's a fun one. Kids like that one, too. Secret code of creation, uh, incredible beauty that God has built into an aspect of creation that you probably haven't thought about and for which there is no secular explanation. Keeping faith in an age of reason, answering over 400 alleged Bible contradictions. That was a fun one to, to look into. Most of them, the, the critic was simply wasn't reading the text very carefully, but there are some cases where I had to go back to the original languages and say, oh, okay, when you really understand what's being said here, there's no contradiction. The physics of Einstein, if you ever wondered what that's all about, that's a, that's a fun area of physics, and I just kind of wanted to share that with people. It's written at a layman level, but there are in-depth boxes, so if you want to go into more details in, in terms of the math, you can do that. And it's, it's just high school algebra, but some people are a little math-phobic, so you can skip the boxes and still uh, get the details. This will also talk about the distant starlight issue, how God got the light from those galaxies to Earth within the biblical time scale. You really need a little bit of a knowledge of physics to understand, uh, at least what I I think the answer to that is. And so the book, there's, a, there's an extended discussion on that in the book. And then uh, again, you can get the books together for a 20% discount, the videos together for a 20% discount, or all that stuff together, almost everything we have for a 30% uh, discount. So that's a great way of getting these things. We've already run out of some stuff, but if you want to get the library pack, we'll, we'll ship you whatever's missing from it later. So you can still get the discount here if you want to do that. And uh, do sign up for our free, free, free monthly newsletter. Just put your email address there because it is electronic. And check us out on the web as well at Biblical Science Institute. We'll be back in 10 minutes and we'll do a Q&A session. So thank you very much. All right, so we got about half an hour for Q&A. We got a microphone right there. And uh, just come on up and ask questions and I'll do my best to answer them if I can. There was a book written, uh, and I know how old it is, Gospel in the Stars. Oh, okay. Could you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, so there, um, there's a couple different versions of that. One that I would definitely reject and the other that I would say is plausible, a little more plausible, but I wouldn't necessarily embrace it. But the idea is that the, the constellations tell the gospel message, basically. The idea is that they're, well, there's two, again, there's two versions of it. One version of Gospel in the Stars says that, that God himself originally named the constellations and named them in such a way as to, to teach the gospel. And certain planets are associated with certain features. There's, you know, there's the constellation Virgo, the Virgin, which might refer to Mary and so on. And that's, that's a clever idea, but I would say that I, I would reject that version of it because the Bible indicates that the gospel is something, it was something of a mystery in the Old Testament. I mean, they had a semblance of it. They knew that the Messiah was going to come but they didn't know the details of that. It was a little bit mysterious to them. They still trusted in God and were saved by faith. But the, the special revelation of God is what gives us uh, the gospel message. The universe tells us God exists, 
tells us something about his power, his nature. Romans 1 makes that clear. Um, if you read Psalm 19, Psalm 19 is wonderful because it, the first few verses are about God's revelation in nature, and then the rest of it is about God's revelation in his word, which is superior to God's revelation in nature because nature tells us we need a savior, but it doesn't tell us how to be saved, it, whereas God's word restores the soul. It, it's what makes us right with God when we embrace his word. So I would reject the notion that God made uh, put the gospel in natural revelation. That's contrary to what the scriptures teach. Then there's another version of gospel in the stars that says, okay, but maybe people having some knowledge of the gospel, which I believe they did, when they named the constellations, did so with knowledge of the coming Messiah. I find that plausible, but here's the thing, nobody knows. Nobody knows because we don't know who, who named the constellation or when. We know they're ancient. They're mentioned, uh, Orion's mentioned in the book of Job. The Pleiades are mentioned in the book of Job. Uh, Josephus wrote that Seth named the constellation, the son, Seth the son of Adam. But of course, that's not scripture. We don't know if that's the case or not. So we just know that they're very ancient. But, but I would be very cautious about saying, well, people named them with the gospel in mind. We don't really know that. Hi, Jason. Good afternoon. I mean, well, good evening. Uh, uh, my wife and I, Jenny, um, are happy to be here. Um, I'd like to ask, a th if I may, a three-part question, but it's all about one issue, revolution. I mean, evolution. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, question number one is, what is your definition of evolution? Question number two is, what is the unbelieving scientific community's definition of evolution? And thirdly, the most important question is, is evolution found in scriptures? Okay. Did I go too fast? I mean, no, that's me, good, that's I, good. Um, my thank, definition, thank sure, yeah, my definition. Well, evolution has a number of different definitions. And uh, what I try to do is I try to, when I, when I use a word, I try to use it one consistently and I try to use it in a way that's consistent with the dictionary. And I, I actually believe we have a moral obligation to do that, because the Bible talks about we're not, we're not to be word wranglers. We're not to, to argue over words, okay? And so that tells me that we should use words in a way that's consistent, in a way that communicates. Uh, evolution, the word evolution can just mean change, right? And that's, that's a legitimate definition, and, and I believe things change, so I believe in that type of evolution. That surprises you? Well, no, not really. Um, and then there's Darwinian evolution. And, and usually when I'm talking about evolution, I usually qualify it at least once. I'll say something like neo-Darwinian evolution or molecules to man evolution, particles to people evolution. Now I'm talking about, about a very specific idea of change, the idea that all organisms are descended from a single celled microbe over billions of years. I'm referring to the, the idea that Darwin had in his mind that's been modified a little bit because Darwin didn't know about mutations and, or, or even um, genes, really. They, they were known, but he didn't know about them. And so uh, neo, it's called neo-Darwinian evolution. And so the evolution that I criticize, the evolution that I try to refute is the neo-Darwinian uh, version of it. So that's the definition that I would use, the, the idea that all organisms are descended from a common ancestor. And evolutionists are not always consistent in the definition they use. In fact, uh, one of the most common fallacies committed by evolutionists is an equivocation fallacy where you change the meaning of the word midstream. And so a lot of times evolutionists will use two different definitions in the same argument. They'll use the Darwinian evolution. They'll say, we know that Darwinian, that evolution is true in the Darwinian sense because, hey, bacteria have evolved resistance to antibiotics. Well, that's a change within a kind. That's consistent with creation. That's not Darwinian evolution. So they've changed the meaning of the word midstream. One of the, one of the main arguments that you'll hear evolutionists use because they're not being consistent with the meaning of the word. They're using two different definitions. And it, what was part? What was part three? Uh, is evolution found in the word of God? Is it found in the word of God? Um, in in a way, it is because remember the, the obviously the Darwinian version wasn't around at the time, but there was uh, Greek thinking where where animals had evolved and so on, and I believe that's what Paul's referring to in Romans chapter one. Uh, when it talks about the people who refuse to give glory to God, but they give glory to birds and creatures and things like that. I think he's referring to that, that Greek version of evolution. So that's, that's the only place I can think of it being mentioned in Scripture as a secular, anti-biblical belief. So your definition is change? I mean, is that what you call, you, Jason calls evolution, change? 
Well, I, I, it, words, again, words can have different definitions. Now, that is a definition, but it's not, that's, not the defi that's not the definition that I'm trying to refute because I believe things change. No, no, I mean, yeah. what do you call it? You specifically say this is, this is evolution. When I'm referring to neo-Darwinian evolution, I'm referring to the idea that all life's descended from a common ancestor. That's what I'm referring to. Okay? Hey, Dr. Lyle. Hi. Thanks for being here. Oh, sure. Um, in Genesis, just before the flood, we're told that the sons of God saw the daughters of man, found them attractive, and the rest is history, and, but they had offspring. Mm -hmm. Then the flood. The suggestion there is because of the very recent, at least in the scripture, idea of the seed of the woman crushing the head of the seed of the serpent, that there is an attack on the genetic line in particular toward the Savior, the coming, coming Messiah. New Testament tells us that Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, and then goes on to describe some things that weren't necessarily common just to that time. But if you go back to Genesis, the one unique thing that glares at you is that attack, whatever, it, however it was. What connection, if any, do you see between the Old Testament flood and the New Testament, especially given what we're doing with chimeras, with genetic alteration, all the things that are going on today in that realm. Okay, uh, I, I, you ask three different creationists that question, you'll get six different answers because we're not in, we're not in universal agreement for that. I'm gonna give you my take on it, okay? That's all I can do. Uh, because some people have said, well, the sons of God, those are angels and they're interbreeding with humans and uh, I, it, a lot of creationists hold to that, I don't. I don't think that's the best explanation. I don't think it's a genetic, uh, issue. Uh, sons of God, that term is used of Christians, it's used of believers. You say, well, that's New Testament. Actually, in the Old Testament, too, son, sons of God can refer to uh, believers, human beings, believers. You say, well, Job 1, the sons of God, you know, they came to worship God, that's the angels. Is it, or is it human, human believers that came to worship God? Well, then Satan came in their midst. Yeah, Satan goes to church, that's fine. Um, so I think, those are, I think those are human beings. And the fact that they're mentioned as sons of God indicating they're, they're believers, they're believers in God. And they married uh, the daughters of men. This, the fact that they're called daughters of men and not daughters of God suggests to me these are not believers. So I believe the problem there is believers marrying unbelievers. And that's something that the Bible says is, is not a good idea. Now, if you're already married to an unbeliever, there's, you know, the Bible talks about how you can deal with that. You know, don't, don't just get a divorce and throw that away. There's, there's, there's qualifications there. But uh, you're, we shouldn't willingly go into a, a marriage between light and darkness because what, 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 that's the problem there. And then offspring are born to these uh, people. It, it refers to them as men. So, right, so again, I, th I think that would kind of lend away from the, well, that's an angel-human hybrid. That makes for great sci-fi, but I don't, think that's the, I don't think that's the right answer. Uh, so you have believers marrying unbelievers, and then the, nef the nephilim is the Hebrew word for the, the offspring, apparently the offspring that were born to them. Uh, that could be related to the Hebrew word meaning to fall, and so nephilim could mean fallen ones. And that's not referring to a, a species, in my opinion, it's referring to a spiritual state, those who fell away from the, the faith. And so the, the Philistines are also referred to as Nephilim. It uses the same Hebrew word there because they fell away from the faith as well. So the problem, we read in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, in my view, the problem is you have believers marrying unbelievers, and as a result, they fell away from the faith. Their offspring were not, were not godly. Uh, the best way to produce godly offspring is to have both parents be godly. So with, with a, the connection today, there is a connection today because that's, that's still a problem today. A lot of, we're seeing a falling away of, of the faith in the, in the world today. The nation founded on Christian principles and we've fallen away from those. So there is a, there is a connection there between the days of Noah and today. Uh, and of course the violence that existed at that time as well is why God wiped out humanity, started over. Yeah, sure. Dr. Lyle, I'd like to um, plug your book, Discerning Truth. Thank it's, you. It's um, a really good idea to get something like that in order to make, uh, to identify logical fallacies uh, that are used in creation, evolution, or arguments. So, Thank you. Appreciate yeah, that. Absolutely. Uh, my question is, um, I, I like softball questions for you. As right. a scientist, um, I like to have predictability and then be able to see something observationally. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm gonna throw out a softball in the uh, astrophysics area. Um, 
uh, Dr. Humphreys, I believe, uh, did uh, an, uh, a prediction on the magnetic field of Uranus and Neptune, mm -hmm. I believe. Could you explain what his prediction was and how it was um, uh, shown observationally? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, so Dr. Humphreys, Russ Humphreys, he's a friend of mine. He's a PhD in physics and a biblical creationist, believes in that God created about 6,000 years ago. And he's contributed quite a bit to astronomy. There's a few things we disagree on, but he's a good friend. And, and one of the models that really impressed me is his model of planetary magnetic fields. Uh, magnetic fields are caused by electrical current in the core of a planet. Because it, that's, that's what causes magnetism is electricity. Maybe you've made a, a little electromagnet, you take a coil, a wire wrapped around, touch the ends of battery, it makes a little magnet there. So you got current, free, freely flowing electricity in the Earth's core, and then the other planets, not all of them, but m most of them. And that current encounters resistance, and so it slows down. And so the mag magnetic fields naturally decay with time. We've been able to measure that with the Earth's magnetic field. We know it's decayed in the last, we've, we've had it uh, measured almost 200 years. We, so we know it, the Earth's magnetic field is decaying. We know the rate at which it's decaying. It's an exponential decay. And uh, Russ Humphreys came up with an idea that, uh, uh, that uh, basically made a, a reasonable guess as to what the starting magnetic field would be for the Earth. Because we know the Earth's made from water, and water has a certain magnetic property to it because of the way the, the uh, electrons and, and that works out. And so he, uh, Russ Humphreys proposed, well, you know, assuming you take the mass of the Earth, assuming it was all water originally, and then God transformed it into other material, but the magnetic field then converted into current at that time. Pretty clever. And uh, you find that if you do that, and then you calculate the rate at which the magnetic field has decayed in 6,000 years, you get the current magnetic field of the Earth pretty close. Pretty neat. And so then he said, well, you know, let's assume for the sake of argument, even though the Bible doesn't say specifically that the other planets are made from water, let's suppose that they were, and calculate what their magnetic field would be after 6,000 years of decay. And you find you get the right answer for Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Pretty neat. Now, at that time, this was back in 80, 84, I think, 84 is when he did this. At that time, we had not visited with spacecraft, the planets Uranus or Neptune. And so Humphrey said, well, let's, let's apply it to those planets. He says, I predict the you know, magnetic field of Uranus will be this amount. I predict the magnetic field of Neptune will be that amount. The secularists thought those magnetic fields would be gone by now because of the, over four billion years they should have run out. And when Voyager 2 went past and, and measured the magnetic field of Uranus, it was within the error bars that, that Humphreys predicted. It, it was, his prediction was right on. And likewise for uh, Neptune. So I think that's a pretty impressive Pretty impressive model, really, and I, I, I appreciate Russ doing that. So that's, there's an example of how you start with biblical presuppositions, you get the right answer. You really do. Okay, good, any other questions? I was out in the back buying a whole bunch of stuff. So you may you have don't answered. Have to apologize well, for you that. may have answered the question already. <laughs> so I apologize if it okay. is a repeat. But I actually have two questions. Okay. So the first one, the argument about Mount St. Helens, that mm -hmm. the rocks that were newly formed mm -hmm. were aged millions of years, even mm -hmm. though they were only what a couple of days old or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. How do they know though that the the rock that came up from the Earth? wasn't in fact millions of years old. So it's possible that even though it's, it was just formed, it could have come from material. Like how do you argue that? Because I've gotten that debate that it was actually in the ground and was millions of years old and then came up and formed a rock. How do you even approach that question? Okay, yeah, you, you need to give them a little lesson on how radiometric dating works. I can tell you that, that nobody knowledgeable of the field would make that argument because the, we, you, know, you can take a, you can dip your stick in the magma in, you know, in the rock hardens, that's what's measured. Uh, people have said, well, maybe, you know, because the elements are older than that. That's what it's detecting. Uh, no, because when it's magma, you see the, the elements can move, it's, it's fluid, they can move in and out. It's only when it becomes rock, it's only when it hardens that the, uh, that the daughter product is then trapped in that, in that system. Okay, and so I think with the ones, I think they used the, uh, 
the potassium argon method with the, the rocks from Mount St. Helens. Argon's a gas, so if, you know, if it's a liquid, it's just gonna bubble right out of there. It's only once it hardens that that gas is somewhat trapped in the rock. Now, gas can leak through rocks over time, too, but it's somewhat trapped, it's only when it hardens that that's the case. And they sent in more than one, they sent in several rocks that were pulled right out of the magma. We, we saw them form, so they're, they're, they're brand new, but you get estimated ages of millions of years. Under the earth, and then became heated and turned into magma. Is, well, it could is have that... been, but but once it becomes magma, that resets the age because the okay. argon can the argon can leak right through the magma. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then the second question I had, you were talking about the half life of C14 mm -hmm. being 50. What was it? 5,700 50, 50, 50,30 years. 5,700 mm -hmm. 50, years. How do we know that if we weren't around for 5,700 years to measure that? Like, Good how do you... question. <laughs> what we can do is we can measure the rate at which a little bit of it decays over a year. Oh, and then you and calculate then, what yeah. percentage decayed, and then, okay, yep. all right, that answered my question. Okay, Thank good. You. Can you tell us about Jesus and Earth Star? Yeah, what, yeah the, uh, the, the star that guided the, the Magi. Um, yeah, of course, we do have a DVD on that, <laughs> which I'm sure you're all gonna get, but uh, spoiler alert, I think it was a supernatural manifestation of God's power. People have tried to make it a supernova, people have tried to make it a comet, people have tried to say it's a conjunction of Jupiter and Venus. None of those fit the description in the text. The, the, the te and I've looked at, I've gone back, uh, I'm by no means a Greek expert, but I've talked with people who are. I said, you know, am I reading this right? Is, is the star really going ahead of them and then standing over where the child was? Yeah, that's what the text means. And no natural object can do that. So I do think it was a supernatural manifestation of God's power. There is a, uh, there's a DVD that's very popular that's put out by a well-intentioned Christian lawyer where he takes a different position, but I don't think that fits the text. I really don't. Uh, it seems to be a supernatural manifestation of God's power, temporary, uh, never to be repeated, the Bible refers to it as his star, which is interesting. So that's, that's unique. Of course, all stars belong to God, but this one is the star of the Messiah. And so it's, it was a unique manifestation of God's power, never to be repeated. Uh, Dr. Lyle, this is probably also in, in your book uh, about the, um, the age of the universe, the light year mm -hmm. measurement. Um, so for the contrarian's argument about the age of the universe. I wonder if you could just touch upon that. And okay, I guess the, uh, the first thing I would say is it doesn't take millions of years for light to get from the stars to the earth, no, not necessarily. There's nothing in physics that requires that. We have measured the speed of light, but the speed of light that we measure, you need to understand how these experiments are done. Uh, one method that's, that's very common is you send the light out, you bounce it off a mirror, you bring it back and you time it and you'd get the, you, you take the total distance, you divide by the time, you get the speed of light. But that's what we call a round trip time average speed. And most people assume that it took light the same time to go out and hit the mirror as it did to come back. But it turns out it's actually impossible to know that. It, and that surprises people, because you'd think, well, I, I, you know, I'll put a clock here and a clock there, and then, then I'll be able to measure it on a one-way trip. But the problem is making sure those clocks are synchronized. And there's no way to do it. He said, well, we'll synchronize them here and we'll move one clock over there. But motion, according to Einstein, affects the passage of time. He said, well, we'll synchronize them by a radio signal, but radio signals travel at the speed of light. So there's no way to do it. And that's, this is a fundamental property of physics. And, uh, and I get well-intentioned people that come up. I think I've thought of a way to do it. No, you haven't. <laughs> Physicists have been trying to do that for 100 years, and there's always a catch. That, it's like a perpetual motion machine. There's always a new patent for one. It's like that actually violates a law of nature, so it's, it's not going to work. I may not be able to see the flaw, but there is one. It's the same way with the, the speed of light. And so the bottom line is Einstein recognized this and wrote about it. He said that the speed of light is not actually the one-way speed of light. The speed of light in one direction is not actually a property of nature at all. It's a supposition, it's not even a supposition, it's a convention, it's something that I can stipulate and that tells me how to synchronize my clocks then. And so the bottom line is, uh, it doesn't take light necessarily any time to get from stars to the earth. It immediately, even today, uh, depending on how you choose to synchronize clocks. And in the ancient world, the way they synchronized clocks was by assuming that light takes no time to get from there to here. And so I believe the Bible uses that convention. And once you recognize that, it's no problem at all to get the light from the galaxies to the earth immediately. 
There's more to it than that. It's, it's a complicated issue, but that's, that's why I wrote the book, The Physics of Einstein. And I do have a series of articles on the website as well. If you go to Biblical Science Institute and you go back a, a few months uh, into the article archives, or there's a topic section. You go to Distant Starlight on Topics, and it's a series of articles where I've, tr I've tried to explain it on a layman level. Uh, I don't know that I always succeed, but I always try. So you might check that out as well. Okay, others? You're a quiet group. Oh, we're going to do that. Okay, yeah. Oh, it does, yeah. Um, yeah, so the question's about basically the origin of the, the sexual organs. And it's, uh, the reason I'm chuckling is because a few weeks ago I wrote an article on uh, irreducible complexity published on the website. And I was going to write a section on that, on that very issue. And so I thought, you know, I need to get up to speed. I need to see what the latest explanations are. And I couldn't find any. I couldn't find any. It's like which, which of the genders evolved first because the, the, the organs that are involved there are very complex and one doesn't work without the other. So I, I and I'm not, and granted, I'm not a biologist. Maybe they, maybe they have covered it somewhere, but, but a, a pretty thorough search over the literature, I couldn't find any examples of that. I'm, I'm sure they have some explanation, but it's obviously not one that they're uh, real happy with because they're not, they're not promoting it very well. I don't think there is an answer to that. There are many, many systems like that in nature that are irreducibly complex, where if you remove one component, the system fails. And so it can't have come about in a, in a piecewise fashion. Very good. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Me again. Um, uh, I believe that uh, God's glory is infinite. Uh, and I think scripture can substantiate that. And I heard you say something in the, the first meeting this morning about really liking astronomy. Am I correct? Is that what you said? And that being said, um, I think God's word substantiates that the universe is infinite because the heavens are declaring God's glory. Uh, so I wanted to ask if you could substantiate uh, anything through, through your studies that the universe is infinite. Okay. Scientifically, we don't know. Could be. It wouldn't have to be. But I, I like that idea. I like the idea. Certainly, the, the, the height of the heavens is used to represent God's glory and his way of thinking. In Isaiah 55, one of my favorite passages, it says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts, and my ways higher than your ways. And uh, I don't know... I, and, you know, I, I don't know that that proves that the universe is infinite, but it's certainly big. And uh, I can I can assure you, as as an astrophysicist, having looked into that, it's it's you, you can't comprehend the scale of the universe. One of the uh, I think we sold out of the Created Cosmos DVD, but at the, at the end of that video, which I wrote for the Creation Museum, it goes out and, and zooms out to the the known universe as far out as we can go into space, and you just see hundreds of billions of galaxies. Each one has hundreds of billions of stars in it, and it zooms all the way back in into the Earth to give you just a little bit of a feel for the the universe that God made. That He just He spoke it and it leapt into existence. It certainly declares His glory. Could it be infinite? Yeah, it could be. It could be. We just. We're finite, though, so if, if it's infinite, we'll probably never know unless God tells us. That's very good. Any other questions? Yeah? Is the, uh, the idea that the substance stood still for a day? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, it was funny because I, uh, I had a reporter come in, and a secular reporter. I was... I had a simulation of the Earth rotating there on my screen. I was doing some astronomy stuff, and he came in and he said, "You know, how do, he, he kind of, you know, 
well, you're a Christian. That's kind of weird, but all right. How did, how did you know, the Joshua's long day, how did that work? Did God really stop the earth, and how, how did he do that? And so I, I said like this, and I hit K, and the earth stopped. And, and uh, you know, I said, you know, this, this is, you know, I can do that because this is, this is my computer program, right? I can do that. Uh, well, this is God's universe. He can do that. He can, I, I think what God did was he stopped the earth and the, and the moon, apparently, in its orbit around the earth. He just stopped them like that. And it, the objections that critics come up with are so ridiculous. We say, oh, you know, why didn't everybody go flying off the surface of the earth? As if God could stop every atom in the earth, but would somehow forget about the very few atoms that are on its surface. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. He can just set, you know, you can just let the angular momentum of everything in this, this sphere be zero. Yeah, not a problem. And uh, so it's a supernatural manifestation of God's power. There's no natural explanation for it, but we have a God who doesn't require natural explanations. He can do what he wants. And there, it was a unique day. There's nothing else like it. The only thing that comes close in Scripture is uh, then when Hezekiah saw the sun, apparently saw the sun go the other way. So the earth reversed direction apparently for uh, what was about an hour or something like that. So uh, that's neat too. Yes? Yes, yeah, how the Lord saved me. Uh, I, I was very young. I was blessed to have been uh, reared in a Christian family. And so I, my, my parents, uh, very fine Christians, and uh, they taught me, you know, they brought me to church. They taught me the scriptures. And when I was six or seven, I, I, you know, I didn't have the advanced theology that I have now, but I knew that I was a sinner. And I knew that, that uh, I needed a substitute. I knew, that, I knew that Jesus died for my sins. And if I repented of them and trusted in him, that he would, he would save me. And so I was very young. And I believe I was saved at that point. And I've, I've grown to love the Lord even more since then. But uh, yeah, you say, I'm, I'm, I feel very blessed to have a very boring testimony. Because uh, a lot of people have to make you know, some mistakes in the world. And, and I'm, I'm so grateful that... The Lord didn't let me hit rock bottom before he saved me. He saved me when I was very young. Yeah, but I now have two sons, and at six years of age, as a parent, you are already whacking them around every corner. So you are lost at that time, and you, you can know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Good. Any others? I'll just say. Uh, yeah, um, I, I do have a, um, I do have a question about the uh, human brain. I guess like I know that maybe okay. like some some um, some evolutionists theorize like how the human brain evolved, and I do know that the human brain is very is, is very complicated. I guess so. I guess um, I was wondering if you could explain like what 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 evolutionists think about the human brain and how it's interconnected or how it's created. Yeah, I don't think they. I I don't think they have a good explanation for that either, because in you know in the, in, the, in the Darwinian evolution, things evolve by accident and they're preserved if they have survival value. But our brain has capacities that are way above the minimum necessary to survival. I mean, we can we can put we can put people on the moon using the, you know the combined collective uh, brains of people. That's, that's amazing. That that would not make sense in an evolutionary perspective, but it makes perfect sense in a creation worldview where we're made in God's image. We have the capacity to be rational. God upholds the universe in a consistent way for our benefit. Mm -hmm. And so I would I would argue that the, the brain is just something that challenges uh, evolutionary notions. It just doesn't make sense mm -hmm. because it's it's far more. It, it's capable of doing far more than it needs to do just to survive. Yeah. And I think that's awesome. I think it's one of, the, one of the ways in which we're made in God's image. We have that capacity to be rational. Animals have a limited ability to think. And I love animals, but uh, we're made in God's image. And, that, and our, our, our brain is different. Of course, in the, in the Christian worldview, our mind is more than just our brain. And that's something that is, is difficult for evolutionists to accept. Because if your brain's just electrical impulses, you can't have any genuine freedom of choice. But in the Christian worldview, you can. Because we're, we're more than just a physical body. We're a body and a spirit. And so in, in how the spirit interfaces with the, the, the brain, how the mind and the brain interconnect, uh, we don't know the details of that. But we at least have a worldview where that's possible because we have a God who controls the physical universe. And so the spiritual can interface with the, the material. Yeah. So I hope that answers yeah. your question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it does. Thank you okay, very much. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, artificial intelligence and where it fits into the discussion. It's something I'm interested in. I haven't 
kept up on the latest, though. I have read some of the works of, of uh, Roger Penrose, and he's a mathematician, and he's interested in that sort of thing. Um, artificial intelligence doesn't generate brand new information. It doesn't. It's not genuine intelligence. Artificial intelligence is when you're able to fool somebody into thinking that something is intelligent, when in fact it's just algorithms. There's no consciousness in computers. And this idea, too, that, oh, you know, if computers were sophisticated enough, they would become conscious. No. Because there's, they already, you're, you can already put more information on a computer than you can put in a, in a, in a brain, potentially, but it doesn't become conscious, you know. So uh, that, the consciousness appears to be an aspect of our spirit, and therefore something that no computer will ever achieve. At least that's, that's my view on it. Yeah, how do you define consciousness? Um, I've looked into that issue a lot, and I haven't found a satisfactory answer to it. Um, it any, basically, anyone who, de who tries to define consciousness ends up using other words that mean consciousness. You know, say, well, self-awareness, okay. Um, how do I define that? I don't know. I, I would say it's one of the ways in which uh, we bear God's image, certainly. It's one of the ways. God's self-aware, he's conscious, and we have that aspect built into us. It's not something that I would say anything that's purely material, like a rock or a tree or anything like that, uh, can do. So it's it's an I think I believe it's an aspect of our spirit. It's it's our self awareness. But again, that's kind of another. That's just a synonym for consciousness. So uh, if any of you come up with a a good answer for that, let me know because it's something I've thought a lot about, but I just don't have a good answer for it. Yeah. Yes, there are some animals that have self-awareness, but it seems to be pretty limited. And the linguistic abilities, too, of animals are very limited. Uh, I've, I've read some articles on this, too, where they'll talk about, you know, you can get, you can get an ape to, to, uh, you know, to, to sign language and, and, and associate certain things with signs, and that's pretty neat. But uh, human beings alone have this linguistic ability to put things together in a new way. Uh, for example, a child might uh, look at a a duck and say, oh, yeah, water bird. They're, they're, they're qualifying it. They're saying that's a bird that, that uh, lives in the water. Apes, they won't, they won't do that. They can't, make that. they can't make that connection, which is interesting. So we do, we do, have, we do have something in us that's different uh, from animals, and I think that's because we're made in the image of God. But yes, animals do have a very limited reasoning ability. And I, I've seen... I, I've seen um, it's interesting too because I got to take I got to take some psychology classes when I was an undergraduate, and I just remember one of the things that is that there's the, the dog, it was a dog and it was on a chain and there's a pole over here and the, the 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 chain was going around the pole and he was trying to get something, and any human would say, "Well, you dummy, you just go around this way," but the dog couldn't it couldn't comprehend that and I just thought that was fascinating. You know, they have the ability to love and and they have a do, they do have some ability to think, but they don't have that capacity for abstract thought that, that human beings have, at least not, may, maybe in a very limited fashion, but not much more than that. Okay, any others? Thanks. Um, hi, thanks for being here. For the brain, we have a normal brain and we have people who suffer from things like mental illness or reoccurring problems, um, would that be like a defect in the gene, the chromosome? Is it more like demonic? Both maybe? I don't know. I'm just... Uh, yeah, it can, it can be either. Um, demons are real. They can influence us. Uh, they can't... They cannot take over a Christian because we're already inhabited by the Holy Spirit. If you're Christian, you can't be demon-possessed. And God keeps them on a short leash, too, in terms of what they can do, really. Uh, but yes, there are, there are physical problems that can happen with the brain. The brain is not exempt from the fall, right? And when the fall happened, sin entered the world, things don't quite work properly the way they're supposed to. And different people get different 
different issues. Different people have different issues. And this is something I think a lot about. I have a brother who has Down syndrome. And I love him more than anybody. He's great. But he, he, he does have a limited capacity to, to reason abstractly. He, can't, he cannot comprehend anything mathematical. But at the same time, I can talk with him about what he watched on TV and, and so on. So it's kind of interesting. And the, and the Lord only expects us to, to do what, you know, what we can do. And uh, I believe the Lord is capable of, of saving people that have mental disorders. That's not a problem for him. He, he can turn my life around. He can turn anybody's life around. Sure. Any others? Yeah. Um, do you believe that dogs go to heaven? <laughs> do I believe dogs go to heaven? <laughs> ah. I, I, I don't think there is a one-to-one -one correspondence for each animal that dies and each animal that will be in the new earth. But I do believe there'll be animals in the new earth. It's a restoration of paradise. And... Um, I also believe that we're not going to have um, unfulfilled desires in heaven because, you know, uh, what is it? Hope, hope deferred makes the heart sick, the Bible says. And so I would say this, if you're in heaven and you miss your pet and you ask God, can you resurrect my pet? I can't think of any reason why I wouldn't. That's the way I'd, that's the way I'd put it. But not poodles. Yeah. <laughs> poodles too. He'll, he'll just fix the mutations, so. <laughs> oh, good. Any others? Yeah. Hi. Okay. So, you know, earlier we talked hmm? about other listening ears, and I said I was a baby Christian. So, can you help me wrap my brain around the reproduction of Adam and Eve or Noah? Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. I know where you're going. I can answer that. Yeah. So originally, God, God made Adam and Eve, and uh, they had children. They had Cain. They had Abel. They had Seth. And people ask, where did Cain get his wife? You know, there, there, there's only the people on the planet. No, the Bible, you read Genesis 5, Adam had sons and daughters. So he had daughters as well. And now, so Cain's wife would have been either his sister, maybe a niece, but probably one of his sisters. And that bugs people because much later in Scripture, much later in Scripture, we read about, uh, God doesn't say you can't marry a relative. He says you can't marry a close relative, okay, in terms of the, the biblical language, because we're all relatives. If you don't marry a relative, you didn't marry a human being, and then you're, real, you're really in trouble. So now today... We don't marry our close relatives because God instituted that around the time of around the time of Moses is when He instituted that law. Abraham was before that. Abraham married his half sister. Sarah was Abraham's half sister. Okay, so that law was not in place yet. Around the time of Moses, God said, "Okay, now you don't marry your close your close relatives. Why? You need to think poodle. Okay, the reason that the reason that purebreds have problems is because they're closely related. It's, it's the result of inbreeding. And when you inbreed like that, it, 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 the, the tendency of getting a mutation from dad and mom at the same site is much higher, and therefore you're, you'll suffer a disease. You see, a lot of times if you get a mutation from uh, the gene of, of one parent, you get a healthy gene from the other, you're fine. You don't, because most, most mutations are recessive. There are some exceptions. But um, if, if you, today, if you married a close relative, it increases the probability that your children will suffer a debilitating effect due to mutations. And I think there's other reasons, too, that God put that institute in it. But it wouldn't have been that way at the beginning, because Adam and Eve had zero mutations when they were created. Their children had very few. Uh, mutations have built up in the human genome over time. And so it wasn't until the time of Moses that they had been built up to the point where it would become uh, a bit problematic for uh, children who are descended from very, very close relatives. Okay, does that answer it? Okay, okay any others? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're all devolving. That's true. Um, yeah, we're, we're all headed toward the sort of the poodle end of the spectrum. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that. Um, 
and, it's, and that's because uh, a lot of mutations are not fatal, they're just inconvenient. And so if you live to reproduce and you pass them on, uh, they accumulate over time. And so I, I think the number is 100. I think you have 100 more mutations than your parents. Now you got three billion base pairs, so that's not a huge number, but it adds up over time. And that's called genetic burden or genetic load. All organisms suffer from that because they're all affected by the, well, all, I shouldn't say all organisms, but all uh, sexually reproducing organisms suffer from that effect. And so uh, in, unless the Lord intervenes or unless we find some kind of technological solution to that, eventually uh, any given species will come to the point where it can no longer uh, interbreed with other members of, it, of its species. It can't, it, it'll go extinct, basically. All species are, are walking time bombs, really, because of the curse, because of the curse. There was the, I remember there was an example of a, I think it was the Florida panther that was on the verge of extinction, and the way they were to save it was to breed it with another variety, and that would cover up some of the mutations. But that particular line is now gone, apparently. So there are things like that. Uh, unless the Lord intervenes, and he could do that through technology, too. He could allow us to discover ways to reverse some of these mutations that have accumulated. That might happen at some point. That would be a good use of uh, genetics, reversing the curse. God calls blessed those things that, that reverse the curse, even if it's in, in a mild sense. Uh, only Jesus can permanently reverse the curse and completely, and that'll be the case in the eternal state. Yes? Yes. Yeah. There. Yeah. There are other ways. Yeah. There are other ways of, of of mutations will happen on their own, but yes, there are other ways to induce them. We know that uh, radiation will do it. Uh, cosmic rays from space. Uh, I live at six thousand feet in Colorado Springs. I get a little higher dose of cosmic rays than you do if you live a little lower down. That's just the way it is, the trade-off for living in paradise. But uh, yeah, there are things that can cause mutations. Certain foods can cause mutations. Certain, there are certain poisons that can cause mutations. I'm not an expert on what they all are, but yes, they're, yeah, mutations can be induced. That's true. Yes? I, um, the individual cells of the body, you mean. Um, I, I'm reticent to get into dietary issues. It's not my area of expertise. Uh, obviously, if you, if you eat healthier and you exercise, it's going to go well for you. I, I mean, there is benefit in that. There's no doubt about that. But into the specifics, I, I wouldn't want to get into that. It's a little, little too beyond my area of expertise. Well, some people believe genetically, and then you can change genetics. Okay, I would say this, you cannot change your DNA sequence through diet and exercise, it's not gonna happen. You can potentially change what's called uh, epigenetic uh, factors. Epigen it turns out, we're, we're learning a lot about this now, that it's not just your DNA that determines uh, your traits, but there, is, there are things that are sort of on the outside of your DNA, DNA that turn on or off certain genes. And those can be activated or deactivated uh, by certain chemicals, for example. And that, there, that, there's an entire rich field of this it's called epigenetics. And some epigenetics are even heritable. They can actually affect your, your children, usually for the negative. But in any case, uh, you, can, you can't change your DNA sequence, but you can potentially turn off or turn on certain genes, uh, either favorably or unfavorably, certain poisons or, or eating healthy, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, any others? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. That's it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, we creationists, most of us, not all of us, but most of us do believe in Pangaea. We think that before the flood, the continents were all together, one supercontinent. Because sometimes people, how do you get the animals to the ark? Well, they, they walked. It wasn't really that difficult. Uh, Getting them to the locations after the flood is a little trickier, but even then it's not that hard because there was an ice age that followed the flood and that would lower the ocean levels by 300 feet and you'd have ice bridges and land bridges in places you don't have today. So when people ask, well, how did the kangaroos get to Australia? Yes, you can say, they hopped. 
but yeah, we do, we do think that Pangea is real, and it's actually a creationist idea. It was uh, what Antonio Snyder Pellegrini, who was a creationist, who proposed that uh, the land masses were connected before the flood, and he, he was, I think, 1800s, and they were pushed apart during that flood. We think, we think that's right. And uh, it was the secularists that were very resistant to that until about the 1960s, when they decided, well, maybe if we slow it down over millions of years, then, then we'll, we can live with that. But uh, John Baumgartner is a PhD a geophysicist who has some detailed computer simulations showing how the continents were pushed apart during the flood year. It's, it's just fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Okay, any other questions? Okay, everybody's satisfied. That's great. That's great. Uh, I'll, I'll stick around if you want to ask a few others. But uh, thank you so much for having me out. I really enjoyed meeting you, and God bless.